pray right now in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, that you move, hallelujah, that you have your way in the name of Jesus, Father God, so the lives will be changed, so the impact will be felt, Father God, hallelujah, and the enemy, hallelujah, will be dismissed. Yes. That the enemy will be disposed, that the enemy will be destroyed, hallelujah, by your power and by your might, Father God. Let me decrease and you increase. Hide me behind the cross. Speak through lips of clay. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. These things we pray in the master's name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, would you please join me in the book of Luke? Luke, the eighth chapter. And if I could draw your attention to the passage of scripture between the 43rd and 48 verses. Luke 8, 43 through 48. Luke 8, hmm. verse 43 through 48. And when you get there, I'm pretty sure that you will all realize that this is a very familiar segment or portion of scripture in the book of Luke. Um, it is a passage that is visited many times and um, we are going to use that to build a case today. 43 through 48, we're going to use that to build a case and the case that we're going to build is how to touch the heart of God. How to touch the heart of God. Verse 43 reads, And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood was staunched. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody hath touched me. For I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Yes. And he said unto her, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Thus ends the scripture. If we had to choose an objective for today, our objective or our goal in today's teaching would be to inspire the hearer to believe in Christ yes. for their deliverance to the extent that they will press, that they will stretch, and they will reach beyond what is normal or comfortable to touch the heart of God. You have to stretch and reach beyond what is normal to touch the heart of God. Amen. Now the woman that this passage is referring to had been dealing with an affliction for 12 years. That's a long time to deal with a problem. That's a long time to suffer. That's a long time to be stuck in a rut. That's a long time to have to fight a fight. But this woman had been dealing with this affliction for 12 years. And it says in this 12-year window of affliction, she spent all that she had acquired in her lifetime. All of her money that she had gotten up until the point that she began to experience this affliction was now gone. All of her resources. She had probably gone to the consignment store and given up all of her worldly values to try to 
break free yes. of this affliction and be made whole. She tried everything. She tried every gimmick. She tried every miracle pill. She tried every medical procedure she could find until she ran out of resources. Mm -hmm. Verse 43 specifically says she spent all her livings, meaning she was now broke. Mm -hmm. She was broke. And I wonder if there is a parallel between her being financially broke and that brought her to the place of being spiritually broken as well. She had to exhaust all of her natural resources to understand that what she needed was something greater than that man was able to provide her with. She needed to maybe reach a place of natural bankruptcy to realize how spiritually impoverished she truly was. Wow. Wow. This woman realized she needed something the man could provide her with. She realized that she, what she had was not subject to what the world had access to. She had to shift her hope from man to God. She had to shift her expectations to the one that could exceed man's limitation. And in order to touch the heart of God, you have to shift your hope and shift your faith from the natural to the supernatural. Yeah, yeah. And you cannot do that until you primarily take God and the word of God and the promises of God as 100% truth. Back in the day, we used to sing a song and we used to say, Lord, I'm trying to make 100. 99 and a half won't do. 99 and a half won't do because it's that half percent that'll trick you up. It's that half right, percent right. that will jam you up. And we have to have 100 percent. We have to have 100 percent belief that God is truth. This is not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. It's not a fairy tale. It's not an option. Right. The Bible declares that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. It's not saying Jesus could be the truth. It's not saying Jesus ought to be the truth. It, not, it doesn't say that there is a high probability. But without a doubt, you got to know that you know that you know that the word of God is true. Yes. And you have to be convinced in order to touch the heart of God. When I think about this woman and this woman's situation, I'm convinced that she was convinced. I'm convinced so much that she was convinced that there was a cure for whatever ailed her that she was willing to give her all to receive it. I'm convinced that she believed that that warlock if that she drank the potion right, that the right. warlock gave her, and I'm elaborating because I don't exactly know where all her resources went right. back in the days, but I'm trying to paint a picture so yeah. you can understand. But that that warlock, if I give you this money, I'm convinced that what you say is true, right? Or or, or if, if if I if I do this ritual, if I if I take these pills, or if if I follow this diet, or if I go to this specialist, that whatever you say, the woman was convinced. Yeah. Because she was willing to invest. She was willing to give. She was willing to spend. She was giving her resources mm -hmm. to the point that she gave up all that she had. Right. She must have believed that that was true. You ever take a moment and think about where you invest your time, your talent, and your treasure? Do you give your resources to a cause or to a goal that is true? Where have you invested all of your worldly resources? Where have you put all of your time? 
you know, I don't want to, I don't want to throw my son under the bus, but um, we had a, a discussion, you know, a little heart to heart about, you know, some of the things that he does with his time management. And he came forth and admitted, he said, you know what, I spend a little too much time playing video games on the internet. And but but he's making an investment in that. Now he gets it honest because you know I've thrown away a lot of countless hours playing video games too, and it seems like the Prince Nazir is following in our footsteps. But the reality is that is a resource. The time is a commodity that we cannot purchase. You only have so much time. What do you do with your time? Where do you invest it? I know me personally, when I used to play video games, I invested and I was convinced that if I played these video games, it would, it, it would somehow vaunt me into some type of feeling of superiority that I could play Madden better than you, that I could beat you at, um, it's, it's Y2K now, it used to be MDA jams, but um, you know, that I, could be, that, that, that I could break your records, that I could beat your high score, that I could do what you could do, but I could do it better. Then my son started beating me at um, Smash Brothers Melee, and I retired. So... <laughs> <laughs> he brought me to reality. I was convinced of something until he brought me to a place of reality. But what am I saying in that little, um, you know, that um, analogy? It was because I was, I, was, I was convinced of something that I was willing to invest so much time in it. It didn't matter if it was true or false. I was convinced enough to give it my resources. I was convinced enough to invest in it. Look at the lies we see people convinced of every day that they're willing to invest in. Watch this. Sleep with this person or you may lose them. Ever heard that before? If you don't sleep with them, they'll sleep with somebody else. So you better do what you gotta do or he gonna walk away. How many times have you heard the story once he got what he wanted, he left anyway. Yep. But the person who participated in that activity was convinced. Right. Convinced enough that they participated. It wasn't true? No, it was a lie. But they were convinced. How many times have you heard people say, oh, it's just a little white lie, so it's okay to tell it? Right. What, 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 what is the, I, I, I don't want to go there, but what's the difference between a little white lie, a big black one? I mean, what's the difference? <laughs> dishonesty is dishonesty. It's a breakdown of integrity. So, but, but, but because society uh, minimizes the little white lie, it's okay. Is that true? No, that's a lie. But we convince ourselves of that lie every day. Um, drink this. It'll loosen you up. Smoke that, it'll make you feel better. Is it, is, it, is it the truth or is it a lie? It's a lie. It's a lie. But we convince ourselves, this is my favorite one, God knows my heart. And because God knows my heart, he'll forgive my sinful behavior. What do you think about that one? What you, what, what, you, what you think about that one? So anyway, anyway, I'm not going to dwell on how much hope and faith and investment we put into lies. Right. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. We put hope in lies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope these 10 lottery tickets I bought hit. <laughs> <laughs> A friend of mine, he uses this great he uses this great analogy and he says people think backwards. He says people will walk around with a lottery ticket and a pack of cigarettes. And they think they have a better chance at hitting the lottery than they have of getting cancer. But the odds are reversed. Right, right. Because you have a high probability of getting cancer if you smoke, and you have almost no chance at all at hitting the lottery. But still, we invest in those lies. And so I'm not going to get on you and talk about, you know, whatever lies that we have invested in in the past. What I will suggest to you is that we need the same conviction when it comes to the kingdom. Yes. We need the same attitude and the same behavior 
when it comes to chasing after our relationship with God. Just think about how you allocate your resources for everything else and what you give God. Right, right. How you allocate your time, how you allocate your money, how you allocate everything, your attitude, your behavior, and then what do you give God? We say this all the time. We've been saying this for years. Why do we always give God the leftovers? The scraps? The crumbs? And we live in a day and age where we need God for so much more than stuff we want. We need God for so much more than cars. We need God for so much more than houses. We need God for miracles. We need God for breakthrough. We need God to help us with our affliction that we've been dealing with for 12 years, for 15 years, for a lifetime, for that deep-rooted stuff. We need a mighty move from God to set us free, but we don't give him a mighty leap of faith. Wow. We need God to move heaven and earth, and we don't even want to get up off of our tail and move at all. The story of the woman with the issue of blood is so powerful because of what the issue of blood represented in that era. The book of Leviticus chapter 15, Leviticus chapter 15, Leviticus chapter 15. Verses 25 through 27 really um, locks in on what makes this example in the New Testament so prevalent right. and such a leap of faith for this woman with the issue of blood. Leviticus 15, verse 25. And it reads... And if a woman have an issue of blood, this is talking about her um, womanly cycle, her monthly cycle, just so we're clear. And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. Every bed whereon she lieth all the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation. And whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. And watch this, whosoever touch those things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if you read through that whole thing, you'll see that if anyone comes in contact with a woman, pay attention, pay attention, while she is on this cycle of uncleanness, now they too are considered unclean. This is powerful. This is powerful. This woman was considered unclean for 12 years. For 12 years. For 12 years. Something that started off normal. Something that was a minor discomfort. Something that should have been taken care of in seven days. That was common to all women. Turned into a 12 year long season of rejection. A season of isolation. A season of whispers behind her back. A season of mockery. Something that should have been done and over with, that was not self-inflicted. Yes. Mm. She had to endure for 12 years. Mm. I was just looking to have a good time. I was just looking to roll in the hay. I didn't know I would catch a sexually transmitted disease. Right. Share. Share. Oh. I was just trying to fit in. Right. So I drank a beer. And then one beer turned into two. I didn't know that I would become an alcoholic. Right. It was something that was just for the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something that I didn't even think beyond the moment about. But now this thing has become an affliction. Mm -hmm. It has become 
a burden. And see, this woman's issue was unique because it wasn't self-inflicted. But a lot of times we find ourselves in bondage because of things that we do, but we don't understand all of the byproducts that come along with it. Yeah. We don't we don't understand all of the side effects. We don't understand the cost and the price of our disobedience. All we're doing is living in the moment, and then we get stuck yeah. in the moment yeah. for hours, yeah. for days, yeah. for months, yeah. for years, yeah. for decades. Yeah. Yeah. For decades, yeah. sure. for 12 years, this woman invested everything that she had. She went to all of the meetings she could go to. She went to all the professionals she could find. She looked on Wikipedia. She did a Google search. Everywhere she looked, she could not find mm, come on. the cure. Jesus. She fought that bondage. Mm with everything she had except for faith and in God. But, but, but when the opportunity came, she took advantage of it. When the opportunity came to put her faith in him, she did not miss it. Don't miss it. Yeah. Right, right. Don't miss it. When Jesus was on the scene, this woman put it all, she put it all, she put it all on the line. Listen, remember, right? She was unclean. Yeah. She was unclean, but this woman entered a crowd. The scripture said that Jesus was surrounded by people. Yes, right, she put it all on the line. Yeah. Everybody knew this woman from town. Everybody saw her 12 for 12 years. She was unclean. Yeah. So if she touched people, they were considered unclean. Yeah. She shouldn't have even been around these people, but she put it all on the line because she had tried everything else, but she hadn't tried Jesus. And she didn't yeah. care about the people ah. screaming at her, unclean, unclean. Yeah. They, she didn't care that the people didn't, they couldn't touch her, so she was cool. But at the same time, they still mocked her. At the same time, they could still expose her. She didn't care who she touched that she got dirty along the way because she was trying to get clean. She didn't care what people thought about her. She didn't care what people might say. She made herself to Jesus. I'm sure she bumped into some people along the way. She put everything on the line. Do you understand? In that day, do you do, do you think that the law would have smiled upon someone who knew that they were unclean, making everyone else unclean? She didn't care. She went against man's law to get to Jesus. She went against man's understanding for her breakthrough. She was willing to press through the crowd to reach and stretch to touch Jesus. I want to know today, are you willing to press and reach and stretch to touch the heart of God? Press means to push against. It means to press against. It means to exert pressure. A press can also mean, watch this, to assault and assail, to forge ahead, to push one's way to move forward. Are you willing to push? Have you ever had to push a car out of the street? <laughs> it's not easy. You have to dig your feet in. You got to get a firm grip. Sometimes you may have to turn around and back into that thing to get your legs more engaged. It takes effort. Mm. It takes effort. Mm. It takes effort, mm. relentless mm. effort to mm. touch the heart of God. Yes. You cannot be passive. You cannot be nonchalant. You cannot be coy about this thing. It takes effort. If you're wondering why God is not moved by your prayer, if you're wondering why God is not moved by your service, it is because God does know your heart. Yeah. God does know what you're capable yeah. of. God does know what's yeah. inside of you. God yeah. knows you have more. He desires more because you desire more. Mm. Come on. Mm. Come on. You have to press. Yes. If you want to touch 
the heart of God. And after the woman was pressing and she was pushing her way through the crowd, I can see her as she got closer and I'm sure that the crowd got thicker and tighter the closer she got to Jesus. And I'm sure she felt at a moment that she couldn't get any closer. And then I begin, I believe she began to reach. I believe she began to reach. Are you reaching for God? Or are you waiting for God to reach you? Are you just sitting there? God, come rescue me. God, come save me. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Reach is an action word. Right. When you reach, it is, you're going after it. You're extending towards it. Are your movements or your action going to help you get closer to God? Are your movements, are your actions, are your decisions going to help you get closer to God? Or are they going to... Watch this. Are your decisions going to distance you from your destiny? Is your, what are you reaching for? Are you forgetting those things that are behind you and reaching for those things that are before you? Are you pressing toward the mark of the high calling which is in Christ Jesus? How will you ever reach God if your hands are going in the wrong direction? And when I say your hands, how are you ever going to get closer to your breakthrough? <sighs> this woman moving in the crowd of the people constantly move toward the direction of Jesus. I'm sure she got bumped to the left. I'm sure she got bumped to the right. But she kept on making her way to Jesus. My mama always says, inch by inch, life is a cinch. Yard by yard, life is hard. So you might have to take baby steps, but it's okay. Just take those baby steps in the right direction. And while she was moving toward Jesus, doubt could have made her turn away. She could have said, this is too hard. Right, right. The crowd could have discouraged her by, by, because they were stronger than her. They were healthier than her. They didn't have the same issue that she had. That could have discouraged her and made her turn away. The past disappointment of all the other things that she had spent her resources on, that she had wasted her time on, she could have gotten halfway to Jesus and said, ah, this ain't gonna work either. And that could have turned her away. But her hunger, watch this, her hunger and her thirst to reach Jesus was greater than her fear. Her hunger and her thirst to reach Jesus was greater than her doubt. Her hunger and her thirst to touch the heart of God was greater than all the disappointment she had experienced up to that point. Your hunger and your thirst to touch God, to get your breakthrough, to get your deliverance has to be bigger than your temptation, has to be bigger than your fear, has to be bigger than the weaknesses that you know you have because in your weakness, God is made great. Yes! Yes, he has. <sighs> you got to press to touch the heart of God. You got to reach to touch the heart of God. And then you got to stretch. You got to stretch. You have to stretch to touch the heart of God. Stretch means to extend. Yes. Stretch means to force or to serve beyond that which is normal or the proper limits. If there's something up high on the shelf and I don't have a chair or a ladder or something to elevate my, my base in order so that I can reach it, I may have to stretch to get what I desire. Right. So what I do then at that point is, is I reach as far as I can, then I reach a little further, then I arch my back, then I get up on my toes, then I might yes. get up on one leg, but I do yes. everything within my power to extend my reach. I stretch. I go beyond that 
is what is normal. It's easy to reach this right here. But if I'm all the way back here and I can't move further, I may have to do a little more to obtain it. You have to stretch. You have to, you have to go beyond that which is normal to touch the heart of God. Watch this. Jesus had to go beyond what was normal to redeem us. That was not a normal crucifixion that Jesus went through. That was not a usual punishment that Jesus endured. When others were crucified, they were tied to the cross. But Jesus was brutally whipped. They placed a crown of thorn on his head. They nailed him in his hands and his feet. And then when they had him stretched out on the cross, they jabbed him in the side with a spear. And if that wasn't enough, then they broke his... Whew. Almost got too far. Almost went too far. Come on, come on, come on. But what I want you to understand is that Jesus stretched. Yes. Jesus stretched. Jesus stretched to redeem us. Jesus went beyond what was common because that is what was necessary to touch the heart of God for us. That is what was necessary so that God could be content with the sacrifice to redeem mankind from all of sin. That reaching, that stretching was what was needed for sinners like us to have an opportunity to know Jesus as the partner of our sins and to come back in to right fellowship. So we also have to stretch to touch the heart of God. We have to reach and stretch beyond what is common. We have to stretch and reach, reach beyond what is comfortable. We have to stretch and reach beyond our previous limitations. Whatever your previous limitations have been, you have to stretch beyond what is fair. You have to stretch beyond what is traditional. You have to stretch beyond what you think. You have to stretch beyond what you understand. You have to stretch beyond what you think you deserve. You have to reach. You have to stretch. You have to stretch. You have to stretch for what you really, really hunger for. Yes. Come on. Come on. Don't settle for a Big Mac if you want a steak. That's stretch. Right. That's right. Right. Don't settle for being on medication when you want to be healed. Stretch. Stretch your faith. Mm. Ooh. 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 Don't settle for being stuck in a wheelchair when you desire to walk. Stretch yeah. your faith. That's right. That's right. Stretch your faith. Don't settle for taking insulin the rest of your life if you believe God can heal you and deliver you from diabetes. Stretch your faith. Stretch your faith. Verse 45, Jesus says. Verse 45. And Jesus said, Who? Who touched me? When all denied. You know, when all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. Yes. Somebody pressed. Somebody reached. Somebody went beyond what was normal. What was logical. Someone went beyond what was realistic to obtain that which previously was not obtainable. And when you apply that type of effort, you touch the heart of God and you know you touch the heart of God because when you touch the heart of God, you will receive his virtue. Yes. Jesus said, I, 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 listen, listen. Jesus said, I know somebody touched me because 
I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. Right. When God feels you touch his heart, there is a release from heaven that is imparted unto you. There is the power of God that is released from him and it is given to you because you touched him. Listen, there was a crowd around Jesus. People were bumping into Jesus. What does that let us know? It lets us know that it is not good enough just to be in the vicinity of Jesus. It lets us know that it's not just enough to bump into Jesus. It lets us know that they were around him. They were in his vicinity. They were hearing him. They were under him. He fed some of them. He prayed for some of them. But they were not touching him because they were not receiving his virtue. He was surrounded by folks with desires that wanted him to fulfill. But there was a crowd, but he knew when one had touched him. And I looked and I searched. I went Greek. I went Hebrew. I went Latin. I went living translation. I went to the, the preacher's Bible. I went everywhere to try to find a deeper translation of touch. Because I wanted to, I just knew that there had to be more to it than meet the eye. And I found nothing. I sat back and I began to ponder and I said, God, how do you want me to express touch and how we touch your heart? And ironically enough, he took me to two people. He took me to Cam Newton, and he took me to LeBron James. Cam Newton? <laughs> the Carolina Panthers. He took me to Cam Newton, and he took me to LeBron James. Now, Cam Newton last season, he got into a lot of trouble because every time he scored a touchdown, he would take the ball and give it to a child in the stands. Yeah, yeah. He didn't give it to someone that was seeking a souvenir. He didn't give it to somebody. He didn't keep it for himself. But the kids touched Cam Newton's heart in a way that he wanted to do something nice for them. LeBron James, after every game, he would be video going into the crowd, into the locker room, and on his way, he would take off his sneakers, and he would autograph his sneakers, and all the people would be reaching out for them, trying to get, just, just, listen, listen, the people were just happy to touch LeBron James. Right, right, come on. <laughs> they come just, on. they were just will, will, willing just to, just to, just to put it, put their hands on him, but he would take his sneakers, and he would give them to a child and walk out of the stadium barefoot. Wow, come on. <laughs> because there was something about those children right, right. that touched the heart of LeBron James. It was something about them. Those two people, those two men, were not moved by the people who were reaching out for them. Right. But their hearts were for the hearts of the children, and that's what compelled them to release. It's the same way with God. It is your heart. We always say God knows my heart. God knows your heart. Listen, He does. He does. And there's no, there's no pretty way to put this. God knows our hearts. Right. You wonder why you're not getting your release? Share that. Because God knows yeah. your heart. Right. You can say it all you want till you blow in your face. You can hide behind that statement as much as you. Who are you to judge? God knows my heart. Okay. And if God knows your heart, and if your heart was so right with him, and if you had a heart like David, and if your heart was so good, then what's the issue here? What's the problem? Right. Why you still got your issue that you've been holding on to for 12 years, woman with the issue of blood? If God knows yeah. your heart, how come you still stuck in poverty? If God knows your heart, how come you're not able to move forward? If God knows your heart, how come you haven't gotten your breakthrough yet? If God really knows your heart, it is, it is because... God knows your heart. Amen. And he knows if he sets you free, then you'll be worse off than you are now. He knows if he delivers you, that you won't do, and you won't give him the glory. You won't give him the praise. He knows your heart. The children of Israel spent all that time in the desert because God knew their heart. Daniel came out of the lion's den because God knew his heart. The Hebrew boys were not consumed in the fire because God knew their heart. 
Yeah. God knows your heart. So when the pressure is on, what happens with your heart? When the scrutiny is high, what happens with your heart? When the temptation is all up in your face, what happens with your heart? When the odds are insurmountable, Will you still plow forward? Will you still reach? Will you still stretch for God with all your hopes, expectations, and trust? What happens to your heart in the press? What happens to your heart in the crowd? What happens in your heart where there is a vast ocean of obstacles that you must overcome to touch the heart of God. Do you give up? Do you quit? Do you doubt? Do you fall back and punt? Or do you go shotgun for them 31 and you snap the ball and you roll out and you scramble and you shake off a tackle? You buy some time. What do you do? Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> do you cock that thing back plant that back foot and release yes what's your hope what's your expectation what's your trust you gotta touch the heart of God people you gotta touch the heart of God it's not good enough to be around him listen it's not good enough to go through the motions. Right. You have to really touch the heart of God with your heart. Mm. He's not impressed with all the dancing. Come on. Mm. He's not impressed with you dropping a lot of money in the plate. He's not impressed with all of your words, with all of your your your, your knowledge, with, with all of your quoting of the scriptures. He's not impressed with your nice suit and your fancy hat. He's not impressed. He is only impressed with your heart. That's where Jesus lives. <laughs> he lives in our heart. God lives in our heart. Why would you subject God to try to reside in a place that is unclean, that is untrue, that is in unfaithful, that is unfit for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that is un, 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 as unprepared, as unkept, as unswept? He can't. He, he, he wants to live in your heart. He knows your heart, but he can't stay there. Only you can clean your heart. So right wrote, Lord, clean. Lord, give me a clean heart so I can serve you. Lord, give us a clean heart today so that we can touch your heart. Receive your virtue and be made whole. All eyes closed, every head bowed. Father God, we thank you for this day. Lord, we ask you right now and we just pray that you help us. You help us, Lord, when we're under the pressure, when we have lost all hope, in man and humanity that when we get to that point of being broken that you enable us to press to reach and to stretch for you God Lord get us to the point where we don't have to get to the place of desperation but we begin to reach for you all the time God not just when we're in panic mode. Yes. Not just when we're dealing with a tragedy, God. 
So let us press toward you. Let us reach for you. Let us stretch beyond what is normal, beyond what is traditional, so that you, Father God, will be satisfied with the effort that we make, God. Lord, give us, give us the mentality of true Levites, that we understand everything is a sacrifice, God. Lord, we are to present our bodies, living sacrifices, holy and acceptable <coughs> unto you, which is our reasonable service, God. Lord, help us as we crucify the flesh when we're tempted. Help us when we're, we're, as we crucify the flesh when anger wants to rise up. Help us when we crucify the flesh because we want to hold a grudge. Help us when we crucify the flesh and do good to those who we know are out to get us. Help us to crucify the flesh. Understanding that every time we crucify the flesh, and we stand on your principle and we use your tools of triumph that we touch the heart of God. And you release your virtue to strengthen us, to encourage us, to inspire us to continue on the journey. To continue taking baby steps closer to your throne. These things we pray in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.